is more likely to hurt me than you because my insurance is very good. I like to call it the spare box because every time something on the real world breaks, instead of making something new to take out this or that, so you notice there's no shooter. And there's also no solar panels, so I can't explain that. Alright, cool. So, so, I'm not going to explain how to actually set any of this up, it's really easy to do that yourself by using the internet. However, actually programming. I think they're on the matter side. It's kind of hard ish, so it's not that well documented how things work, why things work that way. So, we're going to do that. First of all, I hope you guys recognize. Uh, second. There we go. I hope you guys recognize that application. Um, this is what your drivers see when they are behind the glass. Um, that top thing has information. You can make that yourself. You can make that part yourself. The bottom part is basically in stone. Um, that is always the same. That is the part that actually makes you go to your A, your joystick to get it to the robot, and uh, if you need B, that when you press the space bar, when there's blood or smoke or fire, the robot stops doing stuff instead of continuing to hurt or you know, let someone fire. <laughs> You joke, man. I, I've actually been a robot on fire twice. Once. I, I, I've done it twice. One time when a wire actually got stuck in a chain, and the second time when I plugged a custom wire thing in backwards into the digital side part, which I actually realized some of you may not know about it. But yeah, a long time ago when there was a different kind of controller, we had this digital side part thing, and it went on fire easily. And I did that. So yeah. So this gives you information. Um, it also is how you configure stuff. And it might also tell you what kind of joystick you have. So it'll tell you which things are assigned to which places. So you know that you can drive by moving axis 1 and but turn by moving axis 0. So let's actually put the on the robot. And I assume you guys can't see this on here, right? No? Any, any descent from that? Is that is that a good size? Does it need to be bigger? Is it good? Yeah. Yeah. Is it bad for anybody? It hurts, my eyes. It hurts your eyes. It hurts yeah. because, because it's too bright or because it's too small? It's like it's all dark and it's like the background is not. The background is. I I do really like the dark one, but it's like light gray. Alright, okay. J just for you guys, I'm going to change my theme. I really do like it. Um, if I can find it. Uh, yep. Colors and tones. There you go. Do you guys really like that? Oh, I like, I like the other ones. Okay, we are... Okay. We're not, we're not actually going to do it. So first of all, um, this is the code that we had this year on the left side. Um, I am going to open up every package to show every file that we have. Um, there are somewhere between two and 3,000 lines of code in this. This robot, however, does not need two or 3,000 lines of code to function completely. It needs two or 3,000 lines of code to function really well in Linux Vision. But in the space of about 40 minutes, we can program all of this. And we will. So, the program we are going to write today is, let me find it here. There we go. This one. So, it is a total of 143 lines with a lot of blank space and a lot of comments. And actually, let's, let's run this program, shall we? Um, we're not going to be like Cool. Let's just go with this. So that's actually how you 
send your program to the robot, you press that play button, and then it tells you, hey, yeah. I'm sending stuff over. And if you suck at writing some code, it'll tell you that you sucked. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think that WPI did that, but I, I know some people there. If you really want that, you can make it. Yeah, so build successful, so I didn't suck. So let's drive this thing, okay? Do you two want to sit slightly back so there's a barrier of chairs between all of the people here? No, no actually, no, please do. I don't want anyone to get hurt here, and then, mostly because I don't like being yelled at. So you can, like, put, yeah. That guy's our beat shields. Okay, so first of all, really important thing, this button will stop everything. You need to reboot both the robot and the driver station to actually make it work again. This button just kind of stops the code for now. So the whole point of this is if someone is, you know, has their arm in the flywheel and is losing skin, or if a robot is on fire, you can mash the keyboard, and chances are it'll stop the robot. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you just kind of hit it, it, it should work. That's the general idea behind that. Um, so when we start code, we generally have our hand on the enter key though, because you should be you should have a good enough reaction time to stop it from killing you if it has like you know murder code on it or something. <laughs> so yeah, we can oop, it's doing autonomous things. So there we go, murder code. But there we go. We can drive it. It's a code that we'll have done today, we can steer it, and I think we can also move the turret. No, we can't, not at the moment. Um, ah, look at that, it's complaining at me. There's no joystick axis of four. So we can actually change that right now. But let's start from scratch. So let's make a new project. And there are actually three sort of formats that you can use. This is the one that's like recommended. The top one is the one that's recommended and that's hard for me to see. So it's definitely hard for you to see. Let me just fix this real quick. There we go. Much better. All right, so that's the one that kind of people recommend because it allows you to have code sort of separate for like the shooter or for the drive. Um, I personally prefer the middle one because it just kind of puts all the code in one place. So if you're making a simple program, it's all there. You can see it really easily. If you're making a complicated program, chances are you want to make your own code that separates everything out. Um, let's name it something like, um, I, I don't know. Um, and we'll just go. So, okay, now I need to make the font smaller. Alright, so, yeah, this is what you kind of get in the very beginning. Or is it? Actually, no, it isn't. No, no, that's the old code. I'm going to find the new code. It kind of pops up in a random place. There we go, that's what you get in the very beginning. Um, there's a lot of it there, most of it is junk, most of it is useful, useless. Um, the way this works is this, get, this function up there gets called once when your robot turns on, this one once when autonomous starts, this one 50 times a second when autonomous is happening, this one once when uh, teleop starts, and this one 50 times when teleop happens. So, 50 times a second. So that's where most of our code actually goes, there. So let's start. First thing we probably want to do is create this, create something to drive our robot. Um, the way we do this is through object. I presume most of you kind of know Java. Um, if not, you're kind of owned. Um, but yeah, so let's do that. You tell it which port stuff is plugged into. So conveniently, our wiring people are dope, so they made everything go into the right ports. And Eclipse will automatically import all of the things that we need. Like I press Control Shift and Note. That's kind of like the main cool thing about Eclipse. It can do that. It just does stuff automatically for you. Um, we also probably want to be able to get values from our joystick. So. And we tell it that it's plugged into port zero, because that's where it is. And again, it will automatically import stuff, and that's it. 
Um, the way we get values from the joystick, so we want to be able to, to tell the robot, go forward at full speed when the joystick's at full speed, go backwards at full speed when the joystick is backwards at full speed. Um, the joystick will return numbers from one to negative one with zero at the middle, meaning full forward is one on the y-axis, or one axis, that full backward is negative one. Same thing for right and left, same thing for every axis. So let's do that right now. So we can say turn equals to controller dot, and it'll actually give you a bunch of options, and it'll automatically complete stuff for you as you type. So get raw axis, you tell it which axis, so turning happens on axis zero, and bam. We can say move equals to controller dot get yada yada yada. Um, one thing that you do want to pay attention to, actually, this driver station thing, it'll tell you where stuff is, like, like what direction stuff goes, and you may notice that when I push the joystick forward, the y-axis goes down. So for some reason, joysticks are backwards. I don't know why. We're going to put a minus sign in there. If you find out why, please tell me. I've never been able to find out. One of those things that you just don't worry yeah. about. And of course, this is Java, not Python. So we need to tell it what kind of variables those are. And finally, we can do the same thing for driving except backwards. So we can say drive dot arcade drive. And that will tell it, hey, this is how fast we want to move, and this is how fast we want to turn. And bam, let's run that code. Five minutes before finals on Einstein, your mentor is going to tell you, what's taking so long? And you're going to say, it's deploying, and then they're going to get angry. Um, it was worse like about three years ago when it took about a minute for code to get on the robot. Okay, and let's do this. So there you go, right here. Um, I don't know um, how this will affect the floor, so I'm not going to do this too much, but Yes, it is driving, and it is doing so correctly. When I turn left on the joystick, it goes to the left. When I turn right, it goes to the right. When I go backwards, it goes backwards. When I go forward, it goes forward. And if I do both at one time, it'll kind of mark. So there we go, driving. Um, chances are, you also have some other things you want to do. Like, for example, intake a ball. And I'm actually going to have to reference this, because I don't actually know where the intakes are plugged into. Um, now I do, six and five. But again, dirt simple. You create an object that controls that motor. And tell it to import the things that do intake, that do talons. Um, now, do you guys all know what talons are? I hope you do. Okay. So the reason we're not saying motor in the code is because different motor controllers actually need different codes. Some are way more complicated. In fact, we actually have one controlling the turret on this robot. Um, they actually do PID on board and like measuring current and they're all really fancy. Um, we're actually going to cover those too. So yeah, what we could say is for example, um, if we press this button on the controller, so get wrong button, if we press button Let's pick, our, let's pick one at a random from here. Let's say the trigger. If we press the trigger, which should be button one, um, we will do some stuff with the intakes. For example, we will tell the intakes to go at half speed in a certain direction. And again, that simple. And um, one thing we also have to do, and people forget to do this, um, once you've not unpressed the button, the intakes are still going at half speed, so you have to tell them to stop. In fact, a good good practice is to always tell the motors what to do. Never have a point where the motors can be doing whatever they want. Um, you, you joke about that, but I have made that mistake like my third year of programming. And yeah, it didn't go well. I was wondering why the heck the thing was still going when it wasn't, and it turns out the robot had just gained sentience. <laughs> Taking over the world already. Yeah. First they take over our workshops, <laughs> then they take over our cars, then they'll take over the world. Well, it's not a mm. Wait, no, they did that already. Microsoft HoloLens. <laughs> that exists. Sorry. I was, I was thinking about the Yeah, but those sucked. Yeah. 
So if I press this, the intake will run. Um, unfortunately, you can't intake a ball because half of the components necessary for intaking a ball are on the other robot, not on this robot. So there's not really anything it can do other than move around and move its turret. Can't even shoot it. There's no wheels on it, as you can see. So um, last sort of interesting part, I guess, is how do you make stuff go exactly where you want it? Um, there's an algorithm called PID, and actually, I wonder if this will show up well. Let's see if this works. No, I don't want to do that. I want to do that. Let's do that. Okay, so, I'm going to waste all this crap. This isn't necessary. No one cares about this. All right, so what ends up happening is you've got this sort of like real world, and you've got some sensors, which give you information to your actual code, which then has to turn that look random looking information from your sensors into some sort of output that then behaves correctly in the world. Um, you may notice that there is a certain amount of space between stuff in the world happening and the motors actually outputting something to the world, like moving stuff. Um, that's why we need feedback loops. Things aren't instant, so it takes some time for the sensors to read data, and it takes some time for your code to process stuff, and it takes some time for the motors to have enough electrons in them to push. So we need feedback loops for that. Um, one way is PID. I won't have the time to explain it here, because that's not an intro subject. But what it does is it figures out based on where your thing is and where it needs to be and how fast it's going what power to give to the motor so that your thing ends up where it wants to be really quickly. Um, I know that you are all smarter than that, but I don't have time to actually explain it in terms of smart people. So that's what, I'm gonna, that's what I have. So the way we do this is one way, really easily, through CAN. So this thing right here on the back, these smaller controllers are CAN talons. Um, they are like really fancy. Um, you can see I, we actually have one of our encoders going into the talent itself. It actually runs PID loops really, really fast, like a thousand times a second. Um, code runs at 50 times a second, so that's really good. Um, and it kind of automatically does all of that. So you can say, I'm going to make can talent, and we need to figure out where, to plug, where it's plugged in. Um, apparently, it is plugged in to. Where is it plugged in? Oh, there it is. Four. So, and again, I'm going to automatically import everything because uh, Eclipse is dope. And we kind of have to do some stuff, and I will just show you what the stuff is here and then copy and paste it. Um, we have, first of all, I have to tell it that we are controlling its position, our turret in, spe in specifics, this thing. Uh, we're not controlling how fast it's running, we're controlling where it is. There's actually a lot of things you can control. In fact, if I look at the auto completion, Alan control mode dot, you can actually control the current. So you can make sure your motors never fry. Um, hypothetical. I have not tried that. So don't take my word on that. You can get it to do a motion profile. You can tell it to do a percent of the voltage. Um, you can tell it position, you can tell speed, you can tell the actual voltage. Etc. 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 Et et Anyways, um, we're just going to do position because that's kind of what we want. Um, we also need to tell it how many encoder counts it is per times that it spins. So if it spins around once, the encoder is going to give us about three thousand ticks, and that's what we're going to tell it. So now, if I tell it to move one rotation, it will move one rotation. Okay. And actually, I'm just going to actually copy and paste that now because I forgot to do that. And this is all going to go very quickly, like the actual program of this. We're going to run out of stuff to program, because it's actually dead simple to do this kind of stuff, like the basic stuff that doesn't involve running code at different speeds. So the rest of it will be Q&A on how, the rest of the session will be Q&A on how we program our robot. And I don't guarantee that I'll be able to answer all of those questions, because I didn't write it. Um, the guy who was just in here before this, who used to be a student last year, he was captain of the team wrote all of this. So 
Most of it I get. Some of it um, I haven't actually read because he writes everything in spaghetti. So yeah. So we're going to do that. And we can actually say, um, in our thing here, for example, let's make the twisting of this thing control our return. So let's figure out what the twisting is. Number two. OK. And we can say, um, set, I actually forgot what it was called, but there's a thing that you set. There we go. You know this. You can take a nap. Yeah. This is, this is intro. Computer vision was before this. Um, yeah, and then we tell it, um, we're going to just kind of skip the step of putting stuff in a variable and just tell it to take access to the move the turret to die. And let's just go and do that. So, hopefully there's no issues with it. Connecting, cool, awesome. Okay, so let's go. There you go. So I twist slightly, it goes there. I twist more, I twist all the way around, it goes there. And as I bring it back, it goes back. So this is with the default settings. Um, PID needs to be tuned to be really good. Um, some of you may have, I, I don't know if, if you were here last time, maybe Anthony showed you a video of us turning the robot as the turret followed the target and it didn't move relative to the field. Um, that actually takes a lot of just literally changing those little numbers that correspond to P, I, and D and getting them to work. And yeah, that's essentially all there is to basic introductory programming. We still have, what, 20 minutes here? So any, anything else that doesn't involve solenoids or actually shooting a ball? Anyone have any questions? I don't want anything demonstrated. Yeah. What's the difference between three different types of, I know you kind of explained it basically, but what's the difference between the three different types of Motors? programming when you start? Ah, okay, programming. So let's actually make a, here, let's do this. Let's make a, do, 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 let's make a um, command base. Is it gonna show up here actually? Here so, so the command base one adds a lot of code that allows you to separate different parts of your robot. So you can, you can make, for example, a class called the drive, which then you tell it, hey, these axes of, this, of the joystick control the drive. I haven't actually used this in a while because um, Code Orange and 696, both teams that I've been on, um, have actually developed our own version of this because it's actually not only not too hard, but it's also really fun. Um, let's see, where is it? Command base. So you may notice there's a lot more code to start with, so it kind of separates stuff for you already. OI is where you deal with operator interface things, so you put um, their own kinds of joysticks. So you don't say, like, you don't make a joystick object, you make one of their kind of um, button or something. Um, it's been a while since I've done that, so I can't really demonstrate this robot working with a command-based system, because again, we, we wrote our own thing for that. Um, they still have to sort of depend on how um, on how the iterative robot works too. So this actually might look really similar, familiar. So robot in it, you have up there. Um, you have disabled in it. You have um, autonomous in it. You have autonomous periodic. But all of that stuff is basically hijacked by um, the command-based thing to allow you to write slightly more complicated code. And, oh, this is great. Okay, so apparently you see halfway through it. <laughs> I'm gonna not touch that now. And yeah, um, so I can't really ex explain how to use it, but it allows you to write slightly more complicated programs and not get lost in like, with, is, was it line 600 that we did the intake or was it line 7,000? Yeah. But by that point, you should already be separating stuff into your own like separate files and classes. So, um, yeah, learning experiences. Anything else? Uh, like, you said that you developed your own thing for uh, Prototype 6.6. What is what is the difference between that and regular practice? Uh, 
Um, probably ours has slightly less stuff in it. So you notice that the default code here has already five files in it. Um, we have, I think, three sort of generic definitions of what stuff can do, like a subsystem, and we can have a command. And everything else is sort of handled um, through just regular programming. Here, I'll just open the code. Another thing is ours, I think, um, I didn't actually write this part, so I can't explain in particular how it worked, but ours actually had this really dope scripting language that we used for scripting autonomous. So, for example, if you're testing autonomous, autonomy, and you're telling it, hey, um, you know, I need to change this to go two inches farther forward, or the speed needs to go slightly higher. Um, you can redeploy the code, which may take anywhere between 12 seconds, as happens when you have not a lot of code, to 20 or 30 seconds if you have a lot of code. Or you can have the robot read a text file and actually parse it. So that was one of the features that we added in that isn't handled in um, command-based robots. Um, there's also a lot of stuff that command-based does that we didn't really do. For example, um, command-based can deal with whether a certain command owns a system, whether it requires it. So if you have an autonomous command like shoot that needs this turret, and then you have another one called aim that also needs the turret, it won't allow you to run aim and shoot at the same time. We're going to add that in next time. Probably we have a lot of smart people that join the team, so there's going to be a lot of extra code added in. But that's one feature that it adds that we can have. And on 696, we didn't have either until maybe after I left. They had yeah. Anything else? No? Wow. Okay. Um, so I'll add another thing to that autonomous code. Um, not going to do any driving or shooting, obviously, for different reasons. One being that I don't want to put a hole in the wall, and I've done that too. Um, they didn't find out because we put a trash can in front of the hole. Um, yeah, that was when I was like, that's great. So, do as I say, not as I do. Don't put holes in the wall. Um, but we are going to aim and move around. So, you may notice that, where are going? You may notice that this already has a bunch of stuff in it. Um, we don't care about it. We're just going to kind of move it down out of the way and ignore it really hard. There you go. It doesn't exist anymore. That's how code works. As long as you can't see it, it doesn't exist. Um, now we're going to write our own code that does autonomous thing. Now, say we wanted the turret to aim um, in the middle, or forward, wherever it thinks forward is. I don't think it's actually forward in this case, but wherever it thinks forward is, we're going to tell it to aim that there, and then aim like to the right, which I think I think is one because technically because I put the wrong number in for how many rotations the encoder is. One thing we can do is we can tell the robot to first move the turret. So turret dot set. Um, it goes on forever. See that? So that actually is where all of your um, teleop and um, autonomous things are. That's where they live. You just kind of have this view of them, but really this is what's this is the code that's happening. It's kind of calling the stuff that you had. Um, yeah, where is it actually? Teleop periodic. There we go. And this actually happens, you know, 50 times a second. And you want that to keep happening 50 times a second. We actually had a problem in 2013 on 696 where um, the guy who wrote the autonomous code, not me by the way, <laughs> but no, I, I'm, I can't say that I'm not perfect, yeah. But where he actually had, where he actually really quickly hacked together a thing that just told the code to stop doing everything for about three seconds and then shoot and then three seconds and shoot again. And what ended up happening is we didn't have control of the robot for three seconds after autonomous because the autonomous code was still running. Um, there was no way for the FMS to tell it to stop because that loop hadn't finished. That it, instead of looping, it just ran once. And we couldn't figure that out until I looked at it. I'm like, dude, that's the wrong way to do this. So the way you're supposed to do this is to put something called a state machine. So somewhere in here in autonomous, I actually already have one. So a state machine is a sort of artificial construct that you've made that switches states. So the state might be drive forward, and then it might, after it's finished driving forward, whether that be based on time or distance or the alignment of the planets, 
it shoots, and then it does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You might have a really complicated thing where you finish driving and then you have to decide, your state machine decides after it's done driving whether it wants to shoot or whether it wants to aim at the other goal and then shoots and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you need this thing to switch states. Um, the simplest state machine is just one based on time. So that's what's up there right now. And, I, and, once again, I and it's like online and it's like not, it's like really hard to screw it up. Except apparently I've done that actually. You can't um, yeah. yeah, it's learning very slowly. I think maybe I can get rid of some of these. And I can, oh no, there's different ways. This, these ones are faster. There you go. Oh, that's why it's not working. Let's select all the other stuff. There you go. So yeah, and that's robot programming. And notice it will get really good at predicting all of the points in this spiral, but if you extend the spiral out, it will suck at that. Oh. If you extend the spiral out indefinitely, it will still probably suck at that. That is what's called in neural networks overfitting or in machine learning overfitting. Completely irrelevant, but cool. And I believe we're done. Hope you guys like it. Don't be that team that like doesn't move on the field like we were at Chess. <laughs> for like the first couple of matches. It wasn't our fault. It was apparently the FMS's fault. Ha ha ha. So yeah, we can blame the cheesy boost for our loss. Oh. Yeah, it's all rigged. Right. No, actually it was like a really it was like a really like minor thing that like apparently our programmer used something in the FMS that um, like the GPU can't reprogram the whole FMS for their like event, so they like didn't add this one really minor thing that no one uses, but apparently we used it, and that meant that we couldn't move for a certain period of time because we were basing our uh, running autonomous off of the time that the FMS gave us, which it didn't give us during Chevy Champs. Okay, cool. Grand fact is done. Good job, go home, sleep for tomorrow.